Hello. This video is about ENT emergencies, and it is not intended to cover all details of this branch. It will cover the important points with some tips for the exam. According to the curriculum of the Royal College, ENT emergencies include the topics that you see now. Let's start talking about the important details of these topics and let's start with otitis externa. Acute otitis externa may be caused by bacterial infection, fungal infection, seborrheic dermatitis, contact dermatitis, trauma, or environmental factors. Most cases are because of bacterial infection. The most common bacteria that cause otitis externa are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus. For fungi, the most common fungus that causes otitis externa is Candida albicans. The clinical features are itching, pain made worse when the tragus or pinna is moved, tenderness on moving the jaw, discharge, redness and swelling in the external ear canal. For management, consider prescribing a topical antibiotic with or without a topical corticosteroid. Advise the person to use the preparation for a minimum of seven days, but if symptoms persist, the patient should continue using it until they resolve up to a maximum of 14 days. Analgesics can be used as needed. There is a severe form of otitis externa called malignant otitis externa or necrotizing otitis externa. Malignant or necrotizing otitis externa is an extension of otitis externa into the bone of the skull. Infection may spread to the CSF causing meningitis. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the causative organism in 95% of cases. Patients should be referred urgently to ENT if malignant otitis externa is suspected. Now, let's move to acute otitis media. Acute otitis media may be caused by viral or bacterial infection. It is more common in children because they acquire viral infections more often than adults and have shorter and more horizontal eustachian tubes. The most common bacteria causing otitis media is Streptococcus pneumoniae. To diagnose acute otitis media in children, pay attention to the history of rubbing ear, in addition to fever. In adults, there is a history of ear pain. By otoscope, you will find the following. Yellow, red or cloudy tympanic membrane. Bulging tympanic membrane. There may be a fluid level behind the tympanic membrane if there is a fusion. A perforated tympanic membrane can be found in some cases. For management, admit severe cases, cases with complications or children less than three months of age with fever. Give antibiotics for cases who are systemically unwell. No antibiotics needed for mild cases but advise the patient to seek medical help in case of development of complications or if they do not improve within three days. The antibiotic that is to be used is amoxicillin for five to seven days. If there is allergy to amoxicillin, prescribe clarithromycin or erythromycin. Give paracetamol or ibuprofen for pain. One of the most important complications of otitis media is mastoiditis. The tympanic cavity of the middle ear is in communication with the mastoid antrum via a small canal that runs through the petrous temporal bone. Mastoiditis typically occurs when suppurative infection extends from a middle ear affected by acute otitis media to the mastoid air cells. The mastoid air cells are related superiorly to the middle cranial fossa and posteriorly to the posterior cranial fossa. This means that infection of the mastoid can spread to cause intracranial infection. The most common etiologic agent causing mastoiditis is Streptococcus pneumoniae. The characteristic clinical features are protrusion of the pinna, loss of postauricular sulcus, and postauricular swelling, erythema, mass or fluctuance. This is in addition to fever and pain. For management, admit the patient under ENT and high-dose broad-spectrum IV antibiotics should be used, such as IV ceftriaxone and metronidazole. Surgical management is considered in some severe or persistent cases. Now, let's move to the topic of vertigo. Vertigo refers to the perception of spinning or rotation of the person or their surroundings in the absence of any actual physical movement. 
it is important to be able to differentiate between peripheral and central vertigo. The cause of the central vertigo is in the CNS, but the cause of the peripheral vertigo is in the ear. Central vertigo is associated with neurological signs, but peripheral vertigo may be associated with hearing loss. Central vertigo is not associated with severe nausea and vomiting like peripheral vertigo. The patient with central vertigo cannot walk, but the patient with peripheral vertigo can walk although may be unsteady. Central vertigo is associated with positive alternate cover test, but peripheral vertigo is associated with positive head impulse test. Central vertigo is associated with vertical nystagmus, but peripheral vertigo is associated with horizontal nystagmus. The causes of central vertigo include migraine, stroke, transient ischemic attack, cerebellar tumor, acoustic neuroma, and multiple sclerosis. Note that migraine is the most common cause of central vertigo. The causes of peripheral vertigo include benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, and Meniere's disease. In the exam, it is important to know how to differentiate between central and peripheral vertigo, and to differentiate between the different causes of peripheral vertigo. Let's talk about the causes of peripheral vertigo. And let's start with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is thought to be caused by loose calcium carbonate debris in the semicircular canals of the inner ear. When the head moves, the debris moves in the semicircular canals, causing motion of the fluid of the inner ear leading to vertigo. The posterior semicircular canal is the most commonly affected. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo can affect people of any age, but commonly presents between the 5th and 7th decades. And women are affected more often than men. Vertigo occurs in transient episodes, typically lasting less than one minute, and the episodes are preceded by position change. Hearing is not affected. Tinnitus is not a feature of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Diagnose posterior semicircular canal benign paroxysmal positional vertigo if the Dix Hallpike maneuver provokes vertigo and torsional upbeating nystagmus. To perform Dix Hallpike maneuver, ask the person to sit upright on the couch with their head turned 45 degrees to one side. From this position, lie the person down rapidly, supporting their head and neck, until their head is extended 20 to 30 degrees over the end of the couch with the chin pointing slightly upwards and the tested ear downwards. Support the head to maintain this position for at least 30 seconds. Observe their eyes closely for up to 30 seconds for the development of nystagmus. Most people with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo recover over several weeks, even without treatment. Only advise patients to avoid rapid movements. Offer a repositioning maneuver, such as the Epley maneuver. Consider suggesting Brandt de Roff exercises which the person can do at home. You can know more about Epley's maneuver and Brandt de Roff exercises by watching separate videos. No medications are needed for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now, let's move to vestibular neuritis. The terms vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis have been used interchangeably in the past but vestibular neuritis is thought to be due to inflammation of the vestibular nerve. Labyrinthitis is a different diagnosis that involves inflammation of the labyrinth. Hearing loss is a feature of labyrinthitis, but hearing is not affected in vestibular neuritis. Most cases of vestibular neuritis follow a recent viral illness. The vertigo of vestibular neuritis occurs spontaneously, may be sudden, develop on waking, or may worsen over the course of the day. It is exacerbated by changes of head position, but is initially constant even when the head is still. Nystagmus is present and is usually fine horizontal nystagmus. For management, reassure the patient and advise bed rest. If symptoms are severe, Consider giving buccal prochlorperazine, or an intramuscular injection of prochlorperazine or cyclozine. Now, 
Let's move to Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is a disorder affecting the inner ear characterized by episodes of vertigo, fluctuating hearing loss, and tinnitus and is associated with a feeling of fullness in the affected ear. Unidirectional, horizontal torsional nystagmus may be seen. Attacks occur for at least 20 minutes and can last for hours, but not more than 24 hours. This may be because of abnormal endolymph production and or absorption resulting in endolymphatic hypertension. Bromberg's test and Unterberger's test can be used to confirm Meniere's disease. For Romberg's test, the person may be unable to stand with their feet together and eyes closed. For Unterberger's test, if you ask the patient to march on the spot with their eyes closed, the patient may be unable to maintain their position and will turn to the affected side. To rapidly relieve severe nausea or vomiting associated with Meniere's disease, consider administration of buccal prochlorperazine, or a deep intramuscular injection of prochlorperazine or cyclozine. Consider prescribing a trial of beta histine to reduce the frequency and severity of attacks of hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. Now, let's move to cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma is defined as the presence of keratinizing squamous epithelium within the middle ear, or in other pneumatized areas of the temporal bone. Clinical features include hearing loss or tinnitus. There is also recurrent or chronic purulent oral discharge, which may be unresponsive to antibiotic therapy. Discharge is malodorous and may be scant. Otoscopy typically shows a deep retraction pocket in the tympanic membrane, with or without granulation tissue and skin debris, crust or keratin in the upper part of the middle ear, the pars flaccida, or the pars tensor, with or without a perforation of the tympanic membrane. The diagnosis is based on the history and clinical findings. High-resolution CT scan is used for confirmation and assessment of extension. The definitive treatment of cholesteatoma is surgery. Now, let's move to acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is a benign cerebellopontine angle tumor that grows from the superior vestibular component of the vestibulocochlear nerve. The clinical features include unilateral sensorineural loss, intermittent dizziness, caused by cerebellar compression or vestibular dysfunction, unilateral facial numbness, caused by compression of trigeminal nerve, tinnitus, other symptoms, such as headache, diplopia, nystagmus, etc. The gold standard for diagnosis of acoustic neuroma is gadolinium-enhanced MRI. CT can be used but it is less sensitive. The management is by radiotherapy and surgery. Chemotherapy is not effective here. Now, let's talk about traumatic tympanic membrane perforation. Traumatic perforation of the tympanic membrane causes sudden severe pain sometimes followed by bleeding from the ear, hearing loss, and tinnitus. Perforation is generally evident on otoscopy as you see. You should know how to manage traumatic tympanic membrane perforation. You should advise the patient to keep the ear dry. Routine antibiotic ear drops are unnecessary. But if the ear becomes infected, amoxicillin 500 mg orally every 8 hours is given for 7 days. Most perforations close spontaneously within 6 to 8 weeks. Surgery is indicated for a perforation persisting more than 2 months. Now, let's talk about the topic of hearing loss. Hearing loss can be categorized as conductive, sensorineural, or mixed. Conductive hearing loss is due to abnormalities of the outer or middle ear. Sensorineural hearing loss is due to abnormalities in the cochlea, auditory nerve or other structures in the neural pathway. The tuning fork screening tests are used to diagnose the type of hearing loss. These tests are Weber's test and Rinya's test. These tests depend on the idea that the ear is the organ that conducts sound. So, if there is a problem in the ear, the conduction directly through the bone of the skull makes the sound louder than when the conduction occurs through the air and the ear. To perform Weber's test, strike a tuning fork and place its base in the center of the forehead. 
Ask the patient if the tone is louder in the left ear, the right ear or equally loud in both ears. Normally, the sound is heard centrally. This occurs also if there is bilateral symmetrical hearing loss. In unilateral conductive hearing loss, the sound lateralizes to the affected ear. In unilateral sensorineural hearing loss, the sound lateralizes to the normal ear. To perform Rinya's test, strike a tuning fork and place it against the ear canal for two seconds, and the place it immediately against the mastoid process for two seconds. Then is the patient whether the sound is louder through air conduction or through bone conduction. Normally, the air conduction is better than bone conduction, which is called positive rest. In unilateral conductive hearing loss, bone conduction is better than air conduction, which is called negative test. In sensorineural hearing loss, the conduction is is normal. So, Rinya's test alone is not used to diagnose sensorineural hearing loss. Now, let's move to acute sore throat. Acute sore throat means acute tonsillitis or acute pharyngitis, and distinction between them is unclear. Many viral and bacterial infections can cause the condition. Also, there are non-infectious causes that can cause the condition. The diagnosis is clinical and investigations are not performed routinely. The management of sore throat depends on center criteria or fever pain criteria. Center criteria include the following. History of fever, over 38. Tonsillar exudate. Absence of cough. Tender anterior cervical lymphadenopathy or lymphadenitis. Each criterion is given one point. Note that if the patient has sore throat without any other symptoms, then the score is 1. This because the absence of cough makes the patient given one point. For center criteria, a score of 0, 1 or 2 is thought to be associated with a 3 to 17% likelihood of isolating streptococcus. A score of 3 or 4 is thought to be associated with a 32 to 56% likelihood of isolating streptococcus. The other criteria that are used to assess sore throat are fever pain criteria which include fever over 38, purulence, which means pharyngeal or tonsillar exudate, no cough or coryza, attend rapidly, 3 days or less, severely inflamed tonsils. Each criterion is given 1 point. Note here also that if the patient has sore throat without any other symptoms, then the score is 1. This because the absence of cough or coryza makes the patient given 1 point. For fever pain criteria, a score of 0 or 1 is associated with a 13 to 18% likelihood of isolating streptococcus. A score of 2 or 3 is associated with a 34 to 40% likelihood of isolating streptococcus. A score of 4 or 5 is associated with a 62 to 65% likelihood of isolating streptococcus. For management, acute sore throat is self-limiting regardless of cause, bacteria or virus. People who are unlikely to benefit from an antibiotic are people with fever pain score of 0 or 1, or center score of 0, 1, or 2. So, do not give antibiotics to those. People who may be more likely to benefit from an antibiotic are people with fever pain score of 2 or 3. A backup antibiotic is offered here. People who are most likely to benefit from an antibiotic are people with fever pain score of 4 or 5 or center score of 3 or 4. Give an antibiotic to those. The antibiotic to be used is phenoxymethylpenicillin for 5 to 10 days. Now, Let's move to peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar abscess usually occurs in the superior pole of the tonsil. Peritonsillar abscess is often polymicrobial. The typical clinical presentation is a severe sore throat, usually unilateral, fever, and a muffled voice which is called hot potato voice. Pooling of saliva or drooling may be present. Trismus related to irritation and reflex spasm of the internal pterygoid muscle, occurs in nearly two-thirds of patients. The treatment of peritonsillar abscess is by drainage, antimicrobial therapy, and supportive care. Now, let's move to retropharyngeal abscess. 
Retropharyngeal abscess is a neck infection that forms in the potential space between the provertebral fascia posteriorly, the posterior pharyngeal wall anteriorly, the base of the skull superiorly and the mediastinum inferiorly. Retropharyngeal abscess is most common in young children between 2 and 6 years old. The origin is usually spread of infection from an upper respiratory tract infection such as pharyngitis, tonsillitis, sinusitis, otitis media, dental infections. Retropharyngeal abscess often is a polymicrobial infection. Characteristic symptoms include spiking fever, neck pain, especially on movement, torticollis, and dysphagia. For diagnosis, a full blood count with differential should be ordered initially to confirm neutrophilia. Radiological investigations are required to confirm the diagnosis. Plain X-ray of the neck will provide some evidence. Lateral soft tissue X-ray of neck will demonstrate soft tissue swelling posterior to the pharynx, with a widening of the provertebral soft tissue. CT scan is the definitive investigation. For management, the patient should be admitted to the hospital immediately. Initial medical management includes the use of corticosteroids, nebulized adrenaline, and antibiotics. If this is not rapidly effective and the airway is compromised, the patient should be taken to theater promptly for examination under anesthesia with a view to surgical drainage. Now, let's move to glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis. Glandular fever, or infectious mononucleosis, is an infection most commonly caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. The incubation period is about four to seven weeks. The disease is contagious during the incubation period and while symptoms are present, some people may be contagious for as long as 18 months after having the infection. The transmission occurs by one of the following. Contact with saliva, such as through kissing or sharing food and drink utensils. Sexual contact. Blood transfusions. Organ transplantations. Intrauterine transmission. The clinical features include fever, lymphadenopathy, sore throat, non-specific rash, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, upper abdominal pain. For diagnosis, in children younger than 12 years of age and in people who are immunocompromised at any age, use Epstein-Barr virus viral serology after the person has been ill for at least 7 days. In children older than 12 years, Use full blood count with differential white cell count and a monospot test in the second week of the illness. For management, use symptomatic treatment. Prescribe paracetamol or ibuprofen to relieve pain and fever symptoms. Advise the patient to avoid heavy lifting and contact or collision sports for the first month of the illness to reduce the risk of splenic rupture. Exclusion from work or school is not necessary. Now, Let's move to post-tonsillectomy bleeding. Post-tonsillectomy bleeding is an uncommon, but potentially life-threatening event. While the majority of post-tonsillectomy bleeds are self-limiting, a significant minority need to return to theater urgently for control of the hemorrhage. ENT should be notified about all patients admitted with post-tonsillectomy bleeding. All patients must be admitted for observation for 12 to 24 hours. There are two types of post-tonsillectomy bleeding. Primary bleeding, which occurs within the first 24 hours. And secondary bleeding, which occurs after more than 24 hours from procedure. For management, sit the patient up and encourage him to spit blood into a bowl. The patient should be kept, nil by mouth. Consider IV antibiotics, such as benzyl penicillin and metronidazole. Consider IV tranexamic acid. If the patient is not heavily bleeding, use hydrogen peroxide gargles. If there is severe bleeding and awaiting review or transfer, use adrenaline-soaked gauze pressed and held in the tonsillar fossa for as long as possible. Now, let's move to the topic of acute strider. The differential diagnoses for acute strider include the following. Croup, foreign body in the upper airway, angioedema or anaphylaxis abscess, peritonsillar, parapharyngeal or retropharyngeal, epiglottitis, bacterial trachitis. 
Let's start with croup. Croup is a clinical syndrome of a hoarse voice, harsh barking cough, acute inspiratory strider and respiratory distress. Croup is caused mainly by a viral infection, most commonly by parainfluenza virus. You should know Westley Croup score, which classifies croup into mild, moderate, severe and impending respiratory failure. Mild croup is a croup of a score of 0 to 2. Moderate croup is a croup of a score of 3 to 5. Severe croup is a croup of a score of 6 to 11. Impending respiratory failure is a croup of a score of 12 to 17. For management, the mainstay of treatment for croup, regardless of severity, is corticosteroids. Prescribed dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kilogram orally. Oral prednisolone 1 to 2 mg per kilogram is an alternative if dexamethasone is not available. Nebulized budesonide is another alternative to oral steroids if the child is unable to take oral medication. Nebulized adrenaline is used only in children with severe and life-threatening croup. Treatment is with 0.4 to 0.5 milliliters per kilogram of 1 to 1,000 concentration to a maximum dose of 5 milliliters. Mild croup patients can be discharged home following a single dose of dexamethasone. Moderate croup patients should be observed for a minimum of 4 hours following a dose of dexamethasone, then reassessed. Severe croup patients should be admitted. Another cause of acute strider is epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is caused by haemophilus influenza mainly, but also, it can be caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, staphylococcus aureus and misesa. For clinical features, there is a rapid onset of pyrexia, sore throat, muffled speech, or hot potato voice, dysphagia, drooling and strider. The child usually looks unwell in acute distress. Sitting forwards, mouth open, drooling with tongue protruding. No action should be taken that could stimulate a child with suspected epiglottitis unless there are facilities for immediate intubation. Diagnosis is clinical, and fiberoptic laryngoscopy remains the gold standard for diagnosing epiglottitis, as the epiglottis can be seen directly. Lateral neck x ray may be useful if laryngoscopy is not possible. Soft tissue radiograph of the neck may show the thumbprint sign. The cornerstone of management is not to distress the child as this can precipitate complete airway obstruction. In the first instance, IV antibiotics should be administered if intravenous access can be achieved without distress. A third generation cephalosporin should be used. Children under 6 years of age require urgent intubation. In those over the age of 6 years, Observation may be an option following consultation with an ENT and pediatrics consultants. Another cause of acute strider bacterial trachitis. Bacterial trachitis may occur at any age. In the early phase, patients may present similarly to croup, however, there is a failure to respond or only transient response to steroids and nebulized adrenaline, and the condition worsens. The most frequent complication associated with the acute phase of the illness is pneumonia. The causative organisms are Staphylococcus aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Moraxella catarrhalis, and Streptococcus pyogenes. The treatment is by intravenous antibiotics, and endotracheal intubation is often needed. Now, let's move to epistaxis and epistaxis may be anterior or posterior. Anterior epistaxis is the most common and originates from Little's area on the anterior nasal septum, which contains the Kieselbach's plexus of vessels. Posterior epistaxis originates from branches of the sphenopalatine artery in the posterior nasal cavity. Posterior nosebleeds usually occur in older people, are more profuse, result in bleeding from both nostrils, and the bleeding site cannot be identified on examination. For management of epistaxis, advise the patient to pinch the cartilaginous part of the nose firmly and hold it for 10 to 15 minutes, while leaning forwards. If bleeding does not stop after 10 to 15 minutes of nasal pressure, consider nasal cautery using a silver nitrate stick, 
If a bleeding point is identified, or nasal packing. If nasal cautery is used, only cauterize one side of the septum to avoid nasal septal perforation. Nasal packing can be anterior or posterior. If anterior nasal packing is done, observe the patient for 30 minutes. And the pack should be left in place for 24 to 48 hours and follow up arranged with the ENT department. If posterior packing is needed, it is done by ENT. Refer the patient urgently to ENT. Foley's catheters can be used as a temporary solution if urgent referral is not available or if the patient is deteriorating. Now, let's move to nasal fracture. It is now universally recognized that X-rays of the nasal bones are unnecessary as they do not alter the management of the injury. So, nasal fracture is a clinical diagnosis. If there is CSF rhinorrhea, it can be difficult to differentiate between nasal secretion and CSF arising from a nasoethmoidal fracture. Testing for the presence of glucose, which is present in CSF but not normally in nasal secretion, may be falsely positive due to contamination of nasal secretions by blood or tears. Beta-2 transferrin, also known as the tau protein, is almost exclusively found in CSF and is a highly sensitive and specific test for the presence of CSF. For nasal fractures, immediate reduction is not needed. Displaced fractures should be reduced before 14 days. In patients with obvious new deformity or new septal deviation, patients can be discharged home with ENT review within 7 to 10 days of injury. Septal hematoma is a rare problem and more common in children. It can result in a vascular necrosis of the cartilage and possible formation of a septal abscess through secondary infection. Patients with a septal hematoma must be referred urgently to ENT for incision and drainage. Now, let's talk about foreign bodies in ENT. Let's start with the foreign body in ear. You should know the methods of removal of foreign bodies from the ear. The foreign body can be removed by mechanical extraction. This is by forceps removal to grasp the object or hook removal to slide a hook behind the object and pull. Also irrigation can be used. But this is contraindicated for soft objects, organic matter, or seeds, which may swell. Also suction can be used. And this is more suitable for insects, organic matter, and objects with the potential to become friable and break into smaller evasive pieces. It is important to know that insects should be killed prior to removal, using mineral oil or lidocaine 2% before removal. Refer the patient to ENT if there is tympanic membrane perforation, contact of a foreign body with the tympanic membrane, or incomplete visualization of the auditory canal. Also refer the patient to ENT, if button batteries or hearing aid batteries are involved. Now, let's move to foreign body ingestion. Most ingested foreign bodies pass spontaneously. Only 10 to 20% require endoscopic removal, and less than 1% require surgical intervention. Esophageal foreign bodies tend to lodge in areas of physiologic narrowings, such as the upper esophageal sphincter, the level of the aortic arch, and the lower esophageal sphincter. Imaging can be used to localize the site of the foreign body. For all patients with suspected foreign body ingestion, the initial diagnostic test should be biplane radiographs, anteroposterior and lateral, of the neck, chest, and abdomen. If the patient is symptomatic, or if the suspected foreign body has any dangerous characteristics, or if the type of foreign body is not definitively known, CT may be used as the next diagnostic procedure. Urgent intervention, with endoscopic removal, is indicated in the following cases. Signs of airway compromise. Evidence of near-complete esophageal obstruction, such as the patient cannot swallow secretions. The object is sharp, long, greater than 5 cm, or a superabsorbent polymer and is in the esophagus or stomach. The object is a magnet. A disc battery is in the esophagus. Signs or symptoms suggesting impending or complete esophageal perforation. Signs or symptoms suggesting inflammation or intestinal obstruction.
the object is lodged in the esophagus for more than 24 hours or for unknown duration. Now, let's move to foreign body in nose. Foreign bodies can be classified as either inorganic or organic. Inorganic materials are typically plastic or metal. These materials are often asymptomatic and may be discovered incidentally. Organic foreign bodies may include food, rubber, wood, and sponges and tend to be more irritating to the nasal mucosa. Thus, they may produce earlier symptoms. The most common locations for nasal foreign bodies to lodge are just anterior to the middle turbinate or below the inferior turbinate. The most common presentation is unilateral purulent rhinorrhea. Other symptoms are epistaxis, pain, irritation, etc. If the nasal foreign body placement was unwitnessed and the type of nasal foreign bodies is unknown, plain radiography should be ordered to rule out the presence of a button battery. You should know the methods of extraction. You can start with the forced expiration method. Instruct patient to blow hard out of nose whilst occluding the unaffected nostril. You can also try the mother's kiss method. Position the child lying down and ask parent to blow into child's mouth while occluding the unaffected nostril. Also you can use direct instrumentation, hooked probes, balloon catheters, suction, or glue. You should also know the indications for ENT referral, which are Dislodgement of a foreign body into the airway. Several unsuccessful attempts at removal. Button battery foreign body. Non-cooperative child who needs sedation. Difficulty in visualizing the nasal foreign bodies. Potential tumor or mass. Now, let's move to Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is an acute, unilateral, idiopathic, isolated, lower motor neuron facial nerve paralysis. The cause of Bell's palsy is unknown. The diagnosis of Bell's palsy can be made when no other medical condition is found to be causing facial weakness or paralysis. Symptoms suggestive of Bell's palsy include rapid onset facial muscle weakness. This causes a reduction in movement on the affected side, often with drooping of the eyebrow and corner of the mouth and loss of the nasolabial fold. Ear and postauricular region pain. Difficulty chewing, dry mouth, and changes in taste. Incomplete eye closure, dry eye, eye pain, or excessive tearing. Numbness or tingling of the cheek and or mouth. Speech articulation problems, drooling. Hyperacusis. It is important to know how to differentiate between Bell's palsy and upper motor neuron lesion. Note that Bell's palsy is a lower motor neuron palsy. To differentiate between them, Sparing of forehead movement may indicate an upper motor neuron lesion such as stroke. Lower motor neuron lesions do not spare the upper face. For management, advise the person that they should keep the affected eye lubricated with drops during the day and ointment at night. Eye should be closed with a tape at night. For people presenting within 72 hours of the onset of symptoms, consider prescribing prednisolone. There is no consensus regarding the optimum dosing regimen, but options include giving 50 mg daily for 10 days, or giving 60 mg daily for 5 days followed by a daily reduction in dose of 10 mg, for a total treatment time of 10 days. Antiviral treatments are not recommended. Full recovery occurs within 3 to 4 months.